Special holiday edition of Third Impact Anime Podcast. I'm your host, the Holly Jolly Nightmare that is Sully, and with me I have Will. Uh, it is I, Will, the guardian of uh, M and M's uh, and peanut M and M's. Those two varieties in particular, absolutely. Okay, and with me we also have a special guest from the Awesome Cast. We have Anna. Hi, I'm Anna. I'm the guardian of awesome podcast editing. And this time we have a holiday treat for everyone. We are going to be discussing the Sailor Moon S movie. Uh, It is also known as Hearts in Ice. That was its original English dub title. And this is, we chose, I chose this because it is the closest thing we have to like a Sailor Moon Christmas movie, even though it's more like a winter movie with some Christmas, like it's mentioned once and that's it. So, what are you guys, like, relationship with Sailor Moon? Because Anna, I know that, like myself, you are a big-time Moony, but Will, I know that you have seen the classic series, but you're not as, maybe, into the fandom as, as Anna and myself. Yeah, that pretty much sums it up. It was something that was very much a part of my childhood around late 90s, so much with, like, Pokemon or other Toonami shows, so it has a lot of nostalgic connection for me. Um, but honestly, I haven't been too in depth with the show especially into adulthood so i do enjoy it a lot but it's been a long time since i've revisited and critically looked at a lot of the older shows and anna you have been a moony since uh forever (laughs) early 2000 probably uh i and i've not stopped i've always been obsessed with sailor moon it was i found it on toonami randomly one day and I was hooked. I, I think it was around the time they would do their Sunday at, their Sunday Sailor Moon marathon where it was like the specific like Sailor Moon R arc. It was always the same one. It was the same Black Moon arc they always showed. But I loved it. And, and I've kept up with it. It's, it's probably worse now that I'm adult because now I have adult money and I can buy all the new toys. And I've actually just recently got my collection displayed downstairs and it's it's got such a special place in my heart and it's it's brought me so many good friends and everything through it it's actually one of the reasons i knew that basil was the one for me oh my our very first date was the day after my birthday and that week the newest volume of the recent or the the new release kadansha put out had been released and I hadn't yet gotten it and so I told Basil it was my birthday the day before and we went to Books a Million and I told him you know I knew that this was out and he said well go ahead I'll go ahead and get it and I'll, I'll buy it for you well he also bought one for himself and that's when I knew oh I want a man to buy me manga <laughs> Before we start recording, Anna, you were also saying that you had kind of a special connection to this particular movie. Yeah, um, we because you were you you were looking for it for a long time. You you became the scourge of the Walmart. Yes, I <clears throat> when they started releasing the English versions on VHS in the bubble case, like the old Disney case, I would call Walmart. I knew what date it was coming out. I looked on the line. I knew what date they were coming out, and I would call the Walmart's like at midnight and start asking. Hey, do you have this out yet? Do you have this out yet? And they're like, oh my gosh. <laughs> they hated me. And like, they got to the point where they would know, like, like, hi, I'm looking for the new Sailor Moon. It's not out yet. <laughs> or yes, we're putting it out now or something. And I would go and I, w- I had all three of the original English releases on VHS. And I still have them, actually. <laughs> those, those good old uh, clamshell VHS cases yes. that were like... Just they're such a weird tactile part of so many of our childhood. True. Like you, you, you look at those VHS clamshells because I've seen some of them for the original Sailor Moon dub, and like my lizard brain just it activates a certain part of my subconscious uh, that is still eternally like ten years old. <laughs> Christmas Eve, I fall in love and then 
So this movie, as I said before, uh, it's been released a lot. Um, the film was originally released in Japan on December 4th, 1994, as part of the Winter 94 Toei Anime Fair. It was screened along with two other films, Aoki Densetsu Shoot and Osawaga Super Baby, which I have looked into and I can find very little information on. It is All I know is it's probably like the anime boss baby that <laughs> kind of came and went. Uh, Toei Anime Fair was this thing where Toei would, during each of the breaks in the Japanese school year, they have a summer break, a spring break, and a winter break, they would make these theatrical films, and this movie is only about an hour long. Each of the Sailor Moon theatrical releases are only about an hour long because they should be shown on a triple feature. So the idea was, hey kids, it's school break, why don't you spend, you know, all your free time going to the theater and watching your favorite Toei animation on the big screen? And so the idea was, like, you would, you know, call up your theater, you'd get the tickets, and you would go and you would watch your favorite TV anime on the big screen, and it would be a triple feature, and that's why all the films are relatively short. And it's kind of funny, because now you could do just a triple feature of the Sailor Moon theatrical films in that same way, and why they haven't, I don't know. Well, I mean, I would do it. This actually did that, in a way, in a sense. They released the R movie first, but then they released S and Super S, as a double feature when they released them in theaters. And we actually went and watched S and Super S in theaters in one sitting. That's right. I forgot that they did the double feature. I, I was thinking that it was the individual screenings, but they did do that not too long ago, back when going to the movies was a thing that we could do um, in the before times. And I did not see them, though. I remember begging Austin and Tori and everyone to go, and then no one wanted to go with me, so I'm one of those weird people that I do not like to go to the movies by myself. I view it as a sign of, of sadness if you go to the movies on your own. So I was just like, well, I guess I'll just watch it at home then, by myself, and not spend money. But yeah, this was released as a triple feature with those two films. Shoot is a, as a, is a soccer anime, but Super Baby, I cannot find much information even in Japanese. It seems to be one of those things that happened and we all just decided to forget. Probably for the best. Um, then in 2000, Pioneer did the English adaptation Hearts and Ice, um, and that was released on VHS. That is the, that is the release that a young Anna uh, <laughs> became, the, as I said, the scourge of the Walmart for. As yeah. I know, I probably would have done the same thing if I were old enough. Um, and then in October of 2018, as we said, Viz released a new remastered edition with a new dub with the current dub cast, which I like. I've heard some people are not fans of the new dub, uh, but I, having listened to a lot of the episodes that they've done and the Sailor Moon R movie, I have not watched the dub for this movie. I like it. I mean, I, I think it's much better than what we've gotten before, and I think it's perfectly fine if you want to watch Sailor Moon in a dub. Oh yeah, um, I have I have a soft spot for the Deke dub because that's where I started with. But I do think the Viz is really, really well done. I've actually met so many of the voice actresses from the Deke and from the new Viz. And they're they're all such sweet people, and especially the, the Viz ones. These these girls grew up on Sailor Moon, so they're just as big as fans as we are, and so they wanted to do the girls justice, and I think they did. I have watched interviews with the new actors. I have seen some of them at cons. Um, there are quite a few of them who've done other things I really enjoy, so I, I think they were very well cast. And I will say, I do have a very funny story about one of the dub actors. So Amanda Miller plays Sailor <laughs> Jupiter, and she also plays a character, I think, in Fire Emblem, whose name is Sully. Uh -huh. And... Uh -huh. I met her at Animazement, and I had her sign something. I was like, you know, it's funny. You play a character named Sully, and I'm my name is Sully. And she just sort of looks at me and goes, uh-huh. And I was just like, oh. I I thought that that sounded so much more clever in my head. And I, I wanted to, after she signed what I brought to her, I turned around and I walked down the line. And I thought, I just hope God strikes me dead where I stand. Aww. Right here, right now, in the middle of this convention. Um... So, I, if Amanda Miller ever listens to this, I'm so sorry that I was incredibly awkward while you had uh, autographed my manga for me. Nah, I'm sure she just doesn't like Fire Emblem. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, every, okay, here's the thing. Fire Emblem, for me, is very aesthetically pleasing. Like, it has that sort of, like, high fantasy, like, everyone is beautiful and wears elaborate costumes. And then when the you play the actual game, it's a lot of math. And so it's just completely wasted on me. Like, every time I've tried to get into Fire Emblem, like, the story will reel me in, and it's like, oh, God, math. I so, would, uh, yeah, I would watch, like, a theatric performance of Fire Emblem, per se, but not actually I mean, games. give it another two or three years. I'm sure Nintendo's thinking about it. They've seen all of these Takara Zuka review uh, stage plays, and they're probably thinking, hey, we have an IP that's just begging for it. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, this movie has been released... In Japanese and in English twice. Uh, the thing that's fun about this movie, and another reason why it's a great Christmas thing, is because they went all out in Japan when this movie was released. So on November 29th of 1994, they had the Sailor Moon S Express, which was a train that ran from Shinjuku Station to Seibu Yuinchi Station to commemorate the release of the movie. And they had the voice actors of the Inner Senshi and uh, Kotone Mitsuishi, who was Sailor Moon, and 1,500 fans that were selected from a pool of 50,000 by a lottery system. They get on the train, and uh, Kotono Mitsuishi is the conductor, so she's like in character, like acting like as Usagi as a train conductor. So we get off the train, and there was been, like an interview talk show thing with Mitsuishi and the other actresses. Um, they had a character show, like the sort of like Power Ranger sort of things you see people go to Japan, like with the big mascot heads. Um, and then they had Azakawa, who was the singer for the uh, song at the end of the film, Moonlight Destiny. She sang it live at the amusement park. So that was the first thing they had. And then in 94, on December 18th, uh, they had a Sailor Moon S biggest Christmas party event where they had. The performers from the Sailor Moon musical, which was in its second run at this time, so they did like the Dark Kingdom Resurrection was oh. the first musical, and then they did like the revised version, so that cast um, performed at the Christmas party. They had the voice actors and the, the musical actresses in the same thing. We had Asakawa singing again. There was a special show with like the voice actors doing like a live dubbing session. The musical actresses performed some numbers from the song. And they were all dressed as Santa, reindeer, angels, shrine maidens, in tuxedos, and in dresses. So it was like a huge, <laughs> elaborate, ridiculous event, which seems very on brand for the Sailor Moon musicals. Like, of course, I, I want to see... Anza in like a Rudolph get up singing like La Soldier. Like I would yes. live for that. I would go. That sounds amazing, although I'm not sure I would want Usagi to be my train conductor. That is a very I terrifying know, is. idea. So terrifying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just imagining you board the train and all of a sudden you hear the angelic voice of Kotono Mitsuishi and she says as Usagi, I'm gonna warn you right now, I don't know how a train works. <laughs> So in March of 2019, they also announced they were going to be doing a new Sailor Moon stage musical based on the manga that this film was based on, which is, was written by the series creator Naoko Takeuchi. So the coronavirus, we I have not been able to find much news about the new musical. Like they were kind of, you know, coming out with a lot of stuff and it was kind of superseded by the Sailor Moon Ice show they've been working on. I'm I think that's so kind of... disappointed that I hope it comes out. I really do hope the Ice show comes out at some point. I do too, because that had so much like firepower behind it. Like you had like an international cast of like well known ice skaters. You had uh, Takeuchi herself like having a really like large creative input into the project. And like I adore Evgenia Medvedeva. Like she is she is my favorite skater of all. And we should... <laughs> she was a Sagi, yeah. We should mention, yeah, she was Usagi, but the reason she was cast is because she did a Sailor Moon ice she routine did. that she Takeuchi did. saw and then drew her a special image and gave her flowers and everything. And just imagine being so blessed as yeah. to do, like, a Sailor Moon tribute and the creator herself, like, descends and gives you a personalized drawing of Usagi because of your routine. Wow. Like, and so I know, not only... I was going to say, uh, one, another girl, uh, the, an American skater, Mirai, I want to say Nagisa... I know she was cast as Sailor Mars, which I thought was really cool because she's she's a very good American skater, and I thought that was really neat to have her doing Mars. But yes, the ice show has been put on hiatus, yeah. and I'm assuming this new musical has been too because I've not been able to find uh, many updates post the world falling apart. So I really do hope it doesn't become one of those things that, you know, might have been, that they do actually go through with this because I think of 
all of the movies, other than R, this could probably be one of the better stage show adaptations because uh, it focuses on Luna, and Luna is usually left out of the Sailor Moon stage musical. She's only been in a few, a handful of them. Uh, even the recent Nilke uh, production ones have left her out, except for the Nogazaki 46. That Those productions had a Luna puppet, but other than that, she's usually uh, left out, probably because it is very difficult to have Luna portrayed on stage. You either have an actress in a cat costume, which is what they did for the first musical, or you have a puppet, and some people are, are taken out of the story by puppets. Personally, I'm not. I watched the, the newer musical with the puppet, and I thought it, it was fine, but other people, I, I have read people say, no, I, I want to see a cat, and I've tried to explain, you cannot train a cat to run around and talk to Sailor Moon. It, it's not going to happen. If only. Yeah, I, I found the puppet was fine. Like, I really didn't... Uh, either way, I, I've never felt like it took away from it. I am not a Frozen person, but I saw a picture of the, the snowman puppet for the, the Frozen stage play, and that thing terrified me. I can't imagine being a small child and seeing that thing, you know, walk among you on stage. So, I mean, if they can make Luna work, then it's fine. Well, I mean, you know, they, they have the whole Broadway show Avenue Q that's <clears throat> completely puppets. I think there's two humans in the entire show, and it's you know, a, such a well-known musical and it was so successful. And so, I mean, there's obviously good ways to go about using puppets. All of this is to say that this movie is one of the important Sailor Moon theatrical releases. I would say that even though there's only three, uh, this one and R are pretty much the only ones that still kind of resonate in the fandom in any mm -hmm. way because the Super S movie is, or the Supers movie, excuse me, um, it's it's very it's there it's it's a movie it exists just think um, of candy it's, and cookies it. yeah it's <laughs> it's just you know can evil bonbon babies those i think oh are the only God. thing that, the bonbon babies are really the only thing that ever really stick out in my mind about that movie but then you have sailor moon r which is as we all know the gay one where yes. you know mamoru's like jealous ex-boyfriend like comes back to earth and is like well look who you're going around with now and then this one which is where uh, a cat falls in love with a grown man and i feel like you know the two truest love stories of our generation are are these two films yeah yeah <laughs> I think it's important now we kind of delve into where this movie came from and kind of what shaped it into being one of the, the, the better Sailor Moon theatrical releases. So it's based on the side story of the same name, The Lover of Princess Kaguya, that was written by Takeuchi and published in volume 11 of the manga. And basically, after the Sailor Moon R movie came out, she was not satisfied with it and she wanted to regain some creative control over it and she mentions that there may have been some headbutting over it. Like, it's a very, like, professional, like, you know, there, I, I hope I wasn't in the way too much, or I hope I wasn't too stubborn, but you can kind of feel this tension between her and the, the creative staff at Toei on where they kind of wanted Sailor Moon to go, because as Moonies know very well, every adaptation of Sailor Moon, be it the original manga, the classic anime, the live-action version from 2003, uh, Crystal, the musicals, I, I related a lot to Batman, where it's like the Tim Burton movies are not the Christopher Nolan movies. Like, they're the <laughs> same characters, but they're very different ideas of how the universe works, and that's kind of how Sailor Moon is. And the biggest tension usually is between the idea of what the manga should be and the idea of what the anime should be, because they were kind of born at the same time. Sailor V was the original Takeuchi manga, and then Toei approaches her to make an anime, and she creates Sailor Moon to be the basis of the anime, 
and they kind of go their separate ways from there. And there are a lot of things like Diana the Moon Fairy that are ideas she came up with for the anime that didn't go anywhere and kind of died on the cutting room floor. And basically, when it came time to do another theatrical film, she wrote this manga with the idea that it would be adapted into a film project. And because this film, if you have not seen it, it deals a lot with space travel for inspiration, she actually visited the Kennedy Space Center in Florida to watch the space shuttle Columbia launch with the Japanese astronaut Chiaki Mukai on board, who was the first Japanese woman in space, the first Japanese citizen to have two space flights, and the first Asian woman in space. Uh, I do find it very cute, though, that even though she's watching this historic event, the launching of the space shuttle Columbia, uh, the little side manga she writes about her experience, she's very focused on the alligators that she saw while she visited Florida. <laughs> she mentions you can see the alligators, there are alligators that you can uh, take pictures of. She mentions a restaurant has alligator on the menu, but she makes paints say, oh no, these are cattle alligator, these are not the alligator. It's, she's very taken with the alligators, and I find that very cute. That, that like that's again. Really funny. You're watching the space shuttle, and she mentions, like, oh, I wish I could, you know, live here and watch the space shuttle every day. Like, it's such an amazing thing. She's disappointed that they have them so far away from the actual launch site for, you know, safety reasons. And she mentions that, but she just ends it all with, oh, yes, and there are these wonderful alligators that you can see in Florida. You can even eat them, but not those. They have a special kind of alligator that you can eat. Um, so she did her research. She came to America. She saw the launching of Columbia and she used that as inspiration for the manga when she decided to sit down and write it because she wanted to do a story about a spaceman. Definitely seems like a lot of research went into the setting on her part, like going all the way to Florida just to like watch the, the space launch for that. That's a lot of dedication to use that in for inspiration for this film. And she doesn't mention it, but I'm sure that like, Toei or Kodansha, like, one of them probably, like, footed the bill or used it as a business expense. Right. Um, but, but Takeuchi is also, uh, to put it politely, a woman of means. This is a woman who buys, like, high-end designer fashion as a hobby and enjoys antiquing. Um, I, I can also see her being the sort of person that if she had the time in her schedule, she would also, you know, take a vacation to Florida to watch the, the space shuttle launch. And her hobby of antiquing kind of comes into this because uh, the inspiration for uh, Princess Snow Kaguya and her snow dancers actually comes from uh, classic Art Deco, because she began collecting Art Deco antiques around this time. So the snow dancers are based on a sculpture by Theo Vos, who is a German uh, sculptor, and he based his original sculpture on Gertrude Leistakau. And I'm going to make sure that Austin puts a little graphic with the original artwork and Takuhi. Takeuchi's drawings of that artwork and then the character designs for the Snow Dancers and uh, Princess Snow Kaguya because it's kind of interesting to see where we get from the original artwork to her designs and kind of that, that springboard of the, those steps into the process. Um, she thought that the, the statue, which is called the ballerina, it's incorrectly labeled in her notes as Snow Dancer, but it's called the ballerina. Uh, she thought it had the image of a character dancing in a snowstorm, so that's where she got the idea of the Snow Dancers. And then Princess Snow Kaguya herself is based on the sculpture of Antonea by uh, Demetri Kiparus. And the thing is, in the manga, or it's the mix manga release for this volume, she mentions that the name of the sculpture is Salome, and I looked at it, and I could not find any Art Deco pieces that match the drawing that she drew of the original antique that she purchased. And so I've done a lot of research into figuring out which particular sculpture she based Princess Snow Kaguya on, and I found out she is incorrect. The thing is, is that Takeuchi says in the manga it's based on a sculpture of Salome, and it's not. Uh, Kiparus did do a sculpture of Salome that's very similar to the one of Antonea, but if you look at the Antonea sculpture, it matches both the pose, the design, and the description of the color that Takeuchi gives in the manga for the piece that she purchased and based Princess Snow Kaguya on. So Antonea is from a Pierre Benoit novel, uh, Atlantida, that uh, Takeuchi incorrectly identifies as a statue of Salome. But if you look at the three together, both uh, the final design of Princess Snow Kaguya, the drawing Takeuchi does of the antique she bought, 
and the original Kiparu sculpture, they are basically the same. And she mentions it's a milky blue color, which the usually is cast in a milky blue color. These are mass-produced sculptures that would be bought by art collectors. So these are the sort of artistic roots that Takeuchi draws upon for uh, Princess Snow Kaguya and the Snow Dancers. And if you are a fan of Sailor Moon, you know that uh, Takeuchi loves to reference high art, high fashion, mythology, and literature when she comes up with her characters. And I, I love to find those references because it kind of makes Sailor Moon in such a much more richer text than just, you know, she came up with these designs based on you know, popular culture or something, that she kind of goes with these high art, high aesthetic things to come up with her her characters and their uh, visual inspirations. Like, I, I had never known which, or what she had based them on, and looking at them, like, I can completely see it, especially, like, the Snow Dancer, and, like, I, I love it. I think that's just so great to, you know, you, you get inspiration from anywhere. And so I love how much research she does into you know like you said she doesn't just take it from pop culture like she she does research and she you know looks for the best like exactly what she's envisioning and even the story itself i mean the name of the main villain princess snow kaguya is taken from um the story of the bamboo cutter which is usually called princess kaguya mm -hmm. which is a very famous japanese fairy tale and some consider it to be one of the like earliest science fiction stories it is about uh, a bamboo cutter who goes into the forest and he cuts up in bamboo and he finds this tiny magical glowing baby who they he takes back to his wife and they raise as a daughter and she turns out to be a princess from the moon and her people come on a magical chariot from the moon to retrieve her and people usually interpret it as a sort of like ufo story sometimes the sort of like ancient aliens thing which kind of goes into takeuchi's whole deal with like the moon was this beautiful you know extraterrestrial civilization at one point but it has a sort of high fairy tale glamour to it the sort of mix of science fiction and fantasy that makes up the the overall feeling of sailor moon and that kind of like how she draws in this very famous folk tale and kind of makes us think about it because there are four characters who could be considered Princess Kaguya. There is the titular Princess Snow Kaguya. There is uh, Luna, who in her human form refers to herself as Princess Kaguya. There is Himeko, whose name, you know, means literally princess or princess girl. And the uh, uh, Kakeru calls Hime as a nickname. And then we have Sailor Moon, who is literally the princess of the moon. So this is kind of like this mythology kind of weaves itself into all of these characters and from all of these sort of points into the narrative. I will say, I saw the the animated movie, Tale of Princess Kaguya, a few years ago, and seeing it after I've seen Sun the Moon, I was like, oh, I remember this. <laughs> like, I remember, like, things would pop, like, pop out at me that I would remember from the Sailor Moon movie. I mean, I, I love that movie. It is the last hurrah from Takahata. It is a beautiful adaptation of, uh, of a wonderful story. I do love the, the story of, of the bamboo cutter. It's one of my favorite fairy tales. And I love it because, again, it is sort of like this fairy tale version of a science fiction story. I think in the original it's mentioned the princess is like, oh, I was banished from the moon and my punishment was to be on Earth, but now my people have come to retrieve me. And I just, that idea of like, thank you for taking care of me when I was on Earth. I have to go back to my people. Like, there's just something very lovely about that. Yeah. It feels like right. a classic science fiction story through the lens of a fairy tale. And again, that's kind of how I feel about Sailor Moon. It is all about celestial bodies in outer space and alien invaders, but it's put through this high art, uh, high fantasy gloss. You know, the alien invaders are not, you know, they don't come with ray guns and, and machines. They are like the Black Moon Clan who all dress like fashion models and their spaceships are shaped like Moravian stars. It's very wild and out there and freaky and fun. Bokuba, 
息を潜めている。だってサンタのおじさんがおもちゃも。So we've talked about Naoko Takeuchi and her inspiration for making the manga and her reasons for it and what she kind of wanted this film to be. But we haven't really talked a lot about the director. And this is not the same director as the Sailor Moon R movie. This is、uh, Hiroki Shibata. And he became a trainee at Toy Animation after graduating from the Yokohama Broadcasting Technical School, which is now the Japan Institute of the Moving Image,、uh, where he became an assistant director on Dr. Slump, starting with、uh, episode 46 from Penguin Village with Love. Shibata joined Toy after seeing a magazine ad before graduating from Yokohama Broadcasting, having originally planned to go into live action film. Shibata stated his goal was to create a masterpiece like Little House on the Prairie. So, the thing that he was really inspired by was Little House on the Prairie, which kind of fits with Japan's fascination with rustic Western literature and, and you know, things like Heidi, Girl of the Alps, and Anne of Green Gables.、Uh, his daughter, Hikari Shibata, is also now a manga artist. So, we're going to see a lot of people who,、uh, they're sort of a family line of going into anime and manga. So, things Shibata has worked on, he has been a director for Bobo 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 Bobo. Bo, 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 A storyboard、uh, artist and director for Digimon. He has directed episodes of Dragon Ball Z. He has directed episodes of Precure, aka Glitter Force. I'm putting that in there specifically to Vex Tori. And he's also done episodes of Gegege no Kitaro.、Um, he also did an interview where he gave a lot of director's notes. It was, I think it was like a commentary. And this is all coming from the wonderful Tuxedo Unmasked, which is a great. Sailor Moon resource site, especially if you're wanting to learn more about the Japanese side of Sailor Moon's creation.、Um, yeah, I kickstarted his book, but we haven't heard anything about it yet. Yeah, we're still waiting on that book. I'm,、uh, I'm patiently waiting for it to happen. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure it'll happen eventually. Getting a book from being an idea to being a real thing is not as easy as I think many people believe it is.、Oh, yeah. It is not as easy as simply putting your, your self published stuff on Amazon. It is, if you want a real book, it takes a lot of effort and time.、Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So, one thing I find interesting is that、uh, they use blue carbon when transferring over the outlines onto the cells for coloring. And I think that's why the film looks so cold. Like, I look at this movie and I, I feel physically cold. Yeah, that would make sense. <laughs> like, yeah, watching this movie, it, it's the perfect winter movie because it's cold. I mean, it, there's snow everywhere, the sky is almost like uniformly gray in every shot. Um, even when it's not like snowing, and even when like Princess Snow Kaguya and her snow dancers are not themselves attacking, when it's just people going about day to day life in Tokyo, like, there's just something about this movie, and maybe it is the way they, they animated it in particular, that just makes me feel physically cold. Like it makes me want to bundle up with blankets while I watch it.、Um, and, and I think that makes the shots like when we have the girls like sitting together under the kotatsu. I think that's what makes it like extra cozy is like he knows how to balance the colors in this movie where whenever they're outside, all the colors are very washed out and gray and it's overwhelmed with like white and maybe the most、uh, poignant color in the frame is a lot of blue. And then when they're inside, like when they're all together studying or talking together, like. All the colors are warmer, like everything just sort of pops again, and that's what makes it feel like there's this very sharp delineation between the indoors and the outdoors.、Um, and I like that because it gives this film like a texture and a, and a feeling to it that I think that a lot of animation, especially of this kind of caliber, this like we have to put this out as sort of an advertisement for our television show, can lack.、Um, there's a lot more sort of artistic. License taken on the part of Shibata and Takeuchi in both the plot, which I think is more、uh, heavy than the other Sailor Moon theatrical releases, and then the, the actual direction, which feels a little more sophisticated than especially the third movie. I think Ikuhara did his own thing with Sailor Moon R. I, I don't think we can deny that that is an Ikuhara film whatsoever. Oh, yeah.、Um, but I think Shibata also puts his sort of directorial stamp and his sort of created. Creative ethos into this movie, too. So, I, we can also maybe through Shibata talk about the one thing that makes this a Christmas movie, and the reason we're talking about it is 
the infamous tuxedo mask Santa Claus scene. Yes. Mm. So according to, again, Tuxedo Unmasked, who translated all of this information from Shibata's commentary, uh, the producer, Iria Azuma, he was the one that said, uh, let's put in a Santa Claus tuxedo mask thing because it's going to be near December when we release this, and he wanted to have a scene that had something to do with Christmas and New Year's, and that's why we get this scene that really just feels like it comes out of nowhere. It is very much uh, the anime tuxedo mask where he throws a rose, does the least amount of work, and then vanishes. <laughs> um, as, as someone who cites uh, tuxedo mask as one of his favorite characters, I have to tell people, it's like, no, if you read the manga or watch the musicals, he's so he, he actually does things. He's way more in, useful. He's way more yes. useful there. He has powers, he fights, he helps you, and then doesn't just run away. Um, but in the anime, he's very much the sort of Adam West Batman, I am here, I will say some ridiculous corny lines, most of which his voice actor, uh, Toru Furia, just ad-libbed on the spot, and that's why they sound so <laughs> ridiculously over the top and so <laughs> strange. Um, in this movie, he, he shows up on a blimp, in a Santa sleigh with reindeer, he whips off a Santa costume, he throws a top at one of the snow dancers, and the snow dancer is distracted long enough for Sailor Moon to, like, launch a counterattack, and that's all he does. That is the extent of his uh, aid in the battle is throwing a top and being a distraction. But it's one of the best entrances <clears throat> ever. <laughs> True. Uh, of all of the Tuxedo Mask entrances, and there are many of them, and some of them are very ludicrous. I think one of my favorites is when he just, like, turns around and swivels in a barber chair out of nowhere. Oh, yeah. um, but this is definitely, like, number one for me, is pretending to be Santa Claus on the blimp, whipping off the costume, and then, I mean, just... You gotta give him the showmanship. Like, oh, if yeah. you're gonna be a hero... It, and he has the act down pat. He has the Super Sentai thing down. Absolutely. <clears throat> Apparently like, the other ideas... Oh, go ahead, Will. Sorry, I was gonna say that um, even, like, this is my first time watching this film, but that scene of him entering I've seen, but like, many times before online. It's just that oh, iconic. Yeah. It, it is a very popular sort of, like, meme, or like, I, I know pretty much every Mooney uses it for their, like, Christmas thing. Like, yep. everyone's gonna tweet, let's tuxedo mask Santa. <laughs> Every year on December 25th. And I just love the music, like the little, like the, the chorus singing Jingle Bells and the yes. sort of like elevator music. <laughs> like you have this epic battle and then you have this like sort of like easy listening Jingle Bells interrupting the whole thing. Like it, it's very well done. Like it's, it's not like one of those, I can't believe they did this. Like they knew they were going for a comedic moment. I'm sure they're like, this is a movie for kids. Like we're having these really creepy ice people fighting the Sailor Guardians, um, let's put a little levity into the situation. Like, if we're going to acknowledge it's Christmas, but let's do it in, like, a fun way that kind of, like, eases the tension. I think it does it perfectly. Apparently their other ideas were they could have him fly down on a kite, because that's something you do at Japanese New Year's, uh, with skis on his feet, or he would show up playing Hanetsuki, which is a traditional game of, like, Japanese badminton. Um, I... I, I kind of like flying in on a kite with skis, but I don't think that beats Santa Blimp. Now, so I w I'd... I'm trying to remember. I know it's when he's evil tuxedo mask, but there is the one episode where uh, Rei and Usagi and I can't remember his name in Japanese, Chad, uh, goes to the, the ski, ski place. Yeah, so he, he does ski, I think, at one point in the series. Yes, he does ski. We, we watched that. Uh, I, I did like a Christmas anime episodes thing, and I used that as the, the quote-unquote <laughs> Christmas episode for Sailor Moon, only because there is that wonderful music video that someone did of Sailor Mars's actress singing Last Christmas, and they did a music video to that episode. So I consider it the Sailor Moon Christmas episode. Sailor Moon like Christmas that. album? It's not Christmas unless you listen to the Sailor Moon Christmas album. I, I have given Austin strict directions. Here are the files from the Sailor Moon Christmas album. This is the end incidental music for this episode. Then Austin, like, I'm telling you now, you better have When the Saints Go Marching In in here. <laughs> that is Basil's all-time favorite Christmas song now. Because in Japan, I, I think they do think that When the Saints Go Marching In is a Christmas song, so yeah. you just have all the girls of the Sailor Moon cast breaking out into a rousing chorus of Oh, When the Saints Come Marching In. Hey, and it Nick. is wonderful. I mean, yeah, I mean, I'm sure, I mean, the Saints, I should hope he was included in that group. <laughs> right. 
I mean, even though there isn't like a Sailor Moon Christmas episode, I usually watch the the ski episode and the and the uh, ice skating episode around this time of year and this movie. Um, but there is still like a weird amount of Sailor Moon Christmas stuff. There have been multiple Christmas ornaments and trees and uh, the Petit Kata figures. They did like Santa versions of those. Oh, yeah, um, the Sailor there's... Moon store does. Um, they currently have Christmas acrylic stands. I've yeah. seen those. They've had uh, several pieces of key art of Sailor Moon Christmas stuff. Um, I know Sailor Moon drops did like a Christmas special I thing miss because that app so much. I, I love I, the art. I never played it because I I can't get into phone games for whatever reason. But I did love it because I would use the art to make like greeting cards and stuff. I remember last year oh, yeah. I used the the Christmas art to make a little Christmas card for another friend of mine who was a Moonie, and that same friend, uh, my friend Akira, she actually did a Sailor Moon Santa cosplay group. Oh, that's awesome. One year, where they all wore, like, little female Santa suits in the color of their respective uh, guardian. She was, she was Neptune. That's um, awesome. Yes, so there, there is a, if you wanted to have a very Sailor Moon Christmas, it is not outside of the realm of possibility to have, like, a Sailor Moon themed Christmas anything. But yes, so that is, the, that is the entire reason that we are doing this episode at this time of year, and while we have not done our first... Um, because we're doing the movies out of order is because Tuxedo Mask is Santa Claus for a good five seconds in this movie and that is enough to make it a Christmas movie in my book. Yep. Yep. <laughs> This film has been released on at least three separate occasions, at least in the languages that we're most familiar with on this podcast. It has been released in other things like French and Italian and all of that. Um, but because there are so many characters, we have almost all of the Sailor Guardians, uh, save for Saturn, she's not here. Um, and we have Tuxedo Mask and we have the cats and all of these characters. Uh, and there are three separate casts, the original Japanese, the uh, first Pioneer dub, and the Viz dub. I've decided just so that we're not here for three hours, um, that we'll be focusing on the original Japanese cast, and we'll be focusing on Luna, because she is sort of the main character of this particular film, and on our new characters, Kakeru, Himeko, and Princess Snow Kaguya, because this film actually has kind of a pedigree in terms of voice actors. So Luna is, of course, Keiko Han. Um, she very famously plays both Luna and Queen Beryl in Sailor Moon. Um, according to her, there were many times when she would actually have to, like, watch herself when she switched back and forth between playing Luna and playing Queen Beryl, and would actually use one voice for the other. Um, and I find that very funny. And there's all sorts of, like, speculation as to why they cast her as both roles, and my answer is they were probably just, like, wanting to condense the cast, or they thought she would do a good job. I, I've seen all sorts of theories, like, oh, they're trying to disguise that Tuxedo Mask and Mamoru are the same person, or, oh, they want to tie in, like, Sailor Moon's, like, closest confidant with her biggest villain. And it's like, I think it really was just, she had a good voice for both characters. Yeah. I, I cannot justify any of the sort of wild fan theories as to why uh, Han voices both Beryl and Luna. Man, I would um, love to see just some of like or see Queen Beryl say some of Luna's lines or vice versa. That would just <laughs> that be hilarious. Would be amazing. I'm sure someone can edit it. Like I'm <laughs> sure somebody has can, you know, fire up the old Windows movie maker and, and make your wish come true. Uh Keiko Han also comes to Animazement, our home con, quite a bit. And the funny thing is I have not been able to see her once. All the times I go to Animazement, like some something happens or something conflicts and i've not been able to get her autograph and right, so next time she comes we're going i'm skipping momocon i'm sorry jess we'll go <laughs> i know i i'm like with the pandemic i'm like look i realize that life is short and time is precious 
and I must, I cannot let this glaring omission in my Sailor Moon collection continue to haunt me. I am going to get Kego Han's autograph on something for Queen Beryl, because I am more attached to Beryl as a character than I am Luna. I do love her as Luna, but, like, her Queen Beryl is one of my favorite anime performances. I will say, I appreciate Tobias for getting me the Sailor Moon's voice actress, uh, oh god, I can't think of her name! Kotono Mitsuishi. Yes. I waited in line twice for her. I waited in line for three hours on two separate occasions for that woman, and I, it was worth it. Like ba- my, Basil's my very de- lucky I went to the con with him that weekend and didn't go there, because Tobias, if Tobias had not been able to get me that autograph, I would have left. I would have been up in North Carolina, South Carolina, whichever one it is, and I would have been, <laughs> been there with you guys. Just my my depression cured, my anxiety healed, my life blessed. Like it was it was <laughs> so worth it. I think Tobias took a picture of me receiving my autograph from her. It Aww. was just it was a very magical moment for me and just it, it, it I did not think I would ever get the opportunity and when it happened, like it it was just absolutely magical and I, I really hope that I get to have a similar experience with Keiko Han because I do deeply, genuinely love her Queen Beryl. She is also famous for playing La Lasune in Gundam and Queen Promethean in uh, the Maytale Legend OVA for Galaxy Express 999. Um, she also, the interesting thing, she's a very interesting woman. She also is an astrologer, like a Western style astrologer, and she's very into horoscopes and has written several books on astrology. And she was inspired to get into astrology after reading the works of Tomoake Nagare, which is a, he is a Japanese astrologer. I cannot find much information on him. He has written a few books on astrology, and apparently she got to co write a book with him. Um, But she is very into astrology. That's, like, her other big thing. Like, if you look up her, like, information, it's like, voice actor, uh, you know, voice professional, astrologer. It's a very, I'm sure she has a very interesting business card. That's awesome. (laughs) She dreamed of being an actress since she was a child and wanted to perform on Broadway. Uh, She graduated from the Nihon University College of Arts focusing on theater, but was invited by the voice actor Kinji Utsume to try voice acting. Originally, there was, like, this sort of separation between voice acting and, like, stage work, um, and she was kind of worried, like, maybe this will, you know, divert my career, but it didn't really have much of an effect. She still did stage shows while she was doing the voices in Gundam. Um, but during her time in Gu- uh, working on Gundam, she took a week-long trip to New York City, and she saw eight Broadway shows in wow. the span of oh a week. Oh my god. Wow. And overwhelmed by how much work went into mounting a Broadway production, she decided to focus her career <laughs> on voice work. <laughs> She apparently was like, I saw the Broadway shows and I was like, I do not think I can do this. And then she decided to focus her acting career more on the voice acting side. Um, <laughs> her first role was Momoe in Ore wa Tepe, uh, which also had uh, Tuxedo Mask's voice actor Toa as Yoshiyuki. Her first recurring role was Yuri in Chojin Sentai Badarak. And her first main role was Angie Arrington in Angie Girl, aka Joheka no Putti Angie. She also worked extensively with World Masterpiece Theater, doing many voices for classic children's literature characters, and it was one of her favorite jobs. Uh, She frequently, in interviews, talks about how much she loved doing World Masterpiece Theater, which was a very long-running show, and part of, again, that sort of very interesting, like, 70s and 80s uh, thing in Japan, the sort of, you know, renewed fascination with Western... Uh, children's literature again Anne of Green Gables, Alice in Wonderland, The Wizard of Oz, these sorts of anime adaptations they're very well known from that time period. And uh, the voice actress Megumi Han is also her daughter so uh, there's this very cute interview in Japanese I was reading through uh, where it's her and her daughter talking about their careers and what they've learned from each other it's very sweet. So moving from Keiko Han, we go to another one of my favorite voice actors, Eiko Masuyama, a.k.a. Fujiko Mine, a.k.a. Cutie Honey, <laughs> a.k.a. Jane Jetson in the Japanese dub of the Jetsons. <laughs> um, so truly a woman of many talents. She is oh, the yeah. voice of Princess Snow Kaguya, um, and again, one of the all-time greats of Japanese voice acting. As a child, Masuyama actually had a sort of speech impediment where her speech was very slow, and a teacher told her she would never speak properly. 
Then at age 12, she joined the Children's Theatre Company in hopes of helping her voice, and she worked with various theatre troops throughout her young adulthood, and in the 1960s, she joined Alney Production and became a voice actress. Um, in 2017, she received the Service Award of Merit during the Tokyo Anime Award Festival, and now she mostly does like narration work in anime and, and things like that, but she will occasionally reprise her well-known characters. So, again, just one of the, like all-time goddesses of Japanese voice acting again. Just for being Fujiko Mine and Cutie Honey, I mean, imagine imagine being that talented. Imagine being that iconic as a voice actor. Second, imagine being told you would never speak properly and then to make your livelihood about speaking. And that's just one thing I find very interesting is, you know, these people who they, they start in, like, <clears throat> stagecraft or stage acting, and then they become these massive voice talents when they never really thought that they would, because neither Keiko Han or uh, Eiko Masuyama really thought that they would be voice actors as they thought they would be in, like, the theater world. And again, like you said, her teacher saying, you will never speak properly, and then her acting is based entirely in the way she can control her voice. I, I think it's just very fascinating, and it's, it's, a, it's a time capsule to a certain point in, like, acting in Japan where uh, voice acting is not this sort of industry like it is now, where people go specifically to be voice actors. It was people from radio, people from the stage, who kind of, you know, move into, into voice acting as it becomes a bigger field, as people sort of recruit them into it. Right. So, next we have uh, Kakeru Uzura, which is our uh, spaceman character. And I do love that uh, Luna calls him Spaceman at the very end. I love yes. you, Spaceman. <laughs> I, I, I do feel like I, it is kind of like romantic and also just the word Spaceman is, is very amusing to me. So it, yeah. it, I just keep thinking of like David Bowie's like, hello, space boy. Like, <laughs> I feel like that song should start playing after Luna uh, calls uh, Kakeru Spaceman. Um, but he is played by Masami Kikuchi. The biggest role he's known for is Keiichi uh, Morisato in Ah My Goddess. So, you know, one of the most famous harem anime in existence. He is he is that guy. Um, he is also Joe Kido in Digimon, along with tons of other voices. He's kind of like a jobbing actor for Digimon. Um, he is Tenchi in Tenchi Muyo. He is Sonic in the Sonic OVA that we have covered, and that episode will come out eventually but he is sonic he is one of the first voice actors for sonic um he is also another episode we did he is prince haru in the mario anime movie and his most big name recent role is uh, uh monaka in dragon ball super uh also known as the guy with pointy breasts I, that's also not a not a joke or anything that is the character introduces himself as yes i have abnormally pointy breasts Wow, I've not watched much of Super at all, so I, don't, I do not know that character yet. Everything I know about Super comes, like, secondhand, and every time I learn something new about I'm like, wow. All that's I really know is, don't shoot, I'm not gonna he's watch. not black. God. <laughs> I, 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 view, I view Dragon Ball Super as kind of like the latter half of The Simpsons, where I just keep rewatching like, everything original when I get to a certain point. It's like, I know it keeps going, but for me, personally, it ended here. And I'm yeah. okay yeah, with that. It's, yeah. We don't have to keep going. You know, I think the world has had enough of Goku's adventures. Let him just retire to his turnip farm. Yeah. So, originally, Kikuchi wanted to be an actor, like everyone else, but was worried about how stable his career would be as a freelancer. A friend gave him a pamphlet for the Troubadour Music Office, who manages voice actors and singers, and after discovering that uh, Tarako, who is currently the voice of Dongan Ropa's Monokuma, um, and Mariko in Chibi Maruko-chan, uh, was represented by the agency, he decided to audition, and he landed the role of Warrior Three in Aro Battler Doomban. <laughs> So he had that prestigious first role as Warrior 3. His first major role, though, was Mike Coyle in Ninja Senshi to uh, Tobikage, which has now been licensed by Discotech. If you watch the most recent Discotech Day, uh, it is coming down the pipeline. Um, so yeah, you will be able to hear his first major role when you get that Blu-ray set from Discotech. And so finally, we have Himeko Nayotake, who is uh, sort of Kakaru's girlfriend in this film, the woman going into space. 
and she is played by Megumi Hayashibara. Hayashibara is most well known, especially on this podcast, as the voice of Rei Ayaname in Evangelion. She's also the voice of female Ranma in Ranma One Half, Jesse slash Musashi in Pokemon, and Faye Valentine in Cowboy Bebop. So again, we have one of the like all-time greats of voice acting, sort of the the new class of famous voice actors coming in to do this film. Hayashibara's sort of origin story to getting into anime voice acting is that she saw farewell to battle spaceship Yamado in elementary school, which was her first introduction to the idea of voice acting and inspired her curiosity for the profession. She also participated in a fan event for Gout's Express 999, where she played Meitel, and she earned praise from Masako Nozawa, aka Goku, aka Astro Boy. So, uh, Hayashibara had a childhood love of anime and acting, but her parents disapproved of it, and at one point, she actually believed that anime characters lived in the real world. So they were not voiced by actors, they were simply, you know, existing as cartoon people in the real world. And so seeing um, uh, Farewell to Yamato uh, as a child was the thing that introduced the idea of like, oh no, these are actors playing characters, and these are not quote-unquote real people who exist in the world that we live in. And I think that's very cute. It is. I mean, if only. Um, so originally she wanted to be a nurse, and her only acting experience was being in an English language production of Alice in Wonderland where she was Alice. So she uh, does speak English. She was active in her school's English club. And on the same day as submitting the application for nursing school, she had a run-in with a snippy receptionist at the school, and she went to a bookstore to cool off like she was kind of frustrated by the whole thing, and she found an advertisement offering free anime voice acting auditions at the talent agency Arts Vision. And inspired by how frustrated she was by the receptionist being rude to her, she decided to audition. So the reason she became Rei Ayaname is purely out of spite. <laughs> I'll get back <laughs> at you, receptionist. Just watch I me. mean, that just sounds so perfect. <laughs> So several months after submitting a demo tape, she received confirmation of passing the first stage of the audition and eventually decided to continue training as a nurse while voice acting. Her first professional role was Himiko Shinobibe in Mashin Hiro Watudu. Um, and even though she is fully qualified as a nurse, she has never worked as a nurse. But if she wanted to leave voice acting, she could go become a nurse. I mean, that's a good, good plan. And she also worked as a DJ at an ice skating rink while in nursing school, again, tying into the winter theme we have going on here. And she actually do, drew a little autobiographical manga based on her life for the uh, Anime V magazine. So, again, a woman of many talents. I just love that, you know, she did an English language production of Alice in Wonderland with English as her second language. She has a full nursing degree and could become a nurse. And the reason she is a voice actress is, again, sheerly out of spite. <laughs> Like, purely because this one woman was mean to her at the nursing receptionist thing, and then she decides to become a voice actress because of an advertisement she found in the bookstore. Okay, she may be my new hero. <laughs> <laughs> I, I asked Austin, I was like, I know you guys did the Ava episode, so I'm sure you've went through all these, these people's biographies. He's like, no, I did not know any of this. So oh, I'm wow. glad that I did all this extra research, and, you know, we found out this amazing information about her. <laughs> times before and i'm sure anna has too but will you said this was your first time viewing the sailor moon s movie yeah i um hadn't seen it before um i haven't seen any of the sailor moon movies at least to my memory to be honest um i'm more so familiar with bits from the show from toonami days uh but as like a movie like only like you said only like an hour i actually did enjoy it it was very refreshing to see like luna as like a main or quote-unquote main character in this movie uh, so I had a lot of fun watching her, I guess, develop as it went on. Yeah, I think that this film does a great job of, and I don't mean this as a joke, humanizing Luna, because so much of the show is her kind of being either like the scold or the exposition machine. She's there to explain what's going on and tell everyone to transform. Right. Or she's there to say, Usagi, stop being a crybaby, go study. 
you know, stop eating so much. Like, and I think this film really allows her to be her own character with her own sort of like desires and wants and dreams that we don't really get to see in the series or in the manga. She is kind of, you know, just there to scold and to explain things in both of those. So I'm glad that Takuchi took the time to expand her character some more. Yeah, and like, I, it's it's funny because, you know, for someone that, that has followed Sailor Moon for a long time, you know, I know of, it's Luda and Artemis, they get together, they have a baby, like that, they're the ones that are supposed to, but you don't ever think, oh, what if, it didn't happen or what you know they didn't have to get together you know luna fell in love with someone else completely opposite of artemis and so i think that was that was really I, it made me feel really bad for artemis and but also it's just like you see how much he does love her that you know he's like no i'm gonna let her do what she wants to be happy and so it it's kind of like sometimes i feel like there's not a whole lot of like relationship um development with like sometimes even usagi and, and mamaru but you really don't see a whole lot of relationship development with luna and artemis and so i that's one thing i really liked with this movie is that you got to see a lot more of them and that like how that evolves Right, and I've seen some fans who kind of interpret it as like, oh, Artemis is a bad boyfriend or whatever, but if you watch this movie, like, he's very attentive to Luna's needs. He seems kind of, like, aware that she's not, you know, quite right at the moment. And I think it's kind of interesting because this series is so focused on, like, fated love. Like, you know, Usagi and Mamoru are fated to be together. They are sort of soulmates. And it, it kind of turns that on its head. Like, Luna's allowed to have feelings for someone who's not the only other talking cat she knows. Exactly. Um, I, I think it would be, and again, it's like, oh, I guess you have to be with the other talking cat, the other talking space cat. Um, but here it's like, no, she's allowed to, to have feelings for another person and, and explore those feelings. And, uh, again, as much as I kind of, you know, glibly say, oh, it's about a cat falling in love with a, with a human man. Like, it's more about the idea of like, what does it mean to feel an emotional attachment or to feel love for someone? And what do we do when that person maybe doesn't return our love? Um, the whole speech that Usagi gives to Princess Snowkagu at the end, like, you know, that's part of what being human is, is, is being vulnerable of saying, like, to say, I will love this person, I will accept the fact they may not love me back. And I think in a show where so much of the story is, again, fated love, the kind of playing with that is important. I mean, we have seen things like Usagi have crushes on other people or like Mamoru dating Rei, but we never really, it, it always feels like it's going to go back to, at the end of the day, Usagi and Mamoru will be together. That They have to be, it is fated. Um, and this kind of says, well, even if in this universe there is such a thing as like a soulmate a, of a fated love, like part of what the joy of humanity is, is feeling love and also understanding that love is not something that we take from people, it's something we give to people. Right. Right. I think Luna does a really good job at kind of explaining that to Usagi when they're outside the observatory. Um, after Luna goes to visit when he's in the, the hospital bed, or the, mm -hmm. I guess, well, not a hospital bed, but his own bed in the observatory, I guess. He just lives there. Um, but she does a really good job at it, kind of explaining that concept to her. And it gets kind of, honestly, really emotional in a way. Mm -hmm. When Luna's, like, especially coming from a character like Luna, who we, as an audience member, like, come to respect and see her viewpoint on a lot of things. I mean, I, like I said, in the show, she's so much of, like, the sort of mother figure to Usagi. Right. I mean, Usagi does have her own actual mother, but Luna's the one who usually is the one saying, oh, like, here's the lesson of this week, like, do this, like, study more, or, or don't be jealous, or whatever, and, like, seeing Luna, like, again, give him more humanity of, oh, Luna has feelings, she makes mistakes, she she has this rich inner life that we usually don't get to see, I think is is a great story for the movie and you know even the director shibata he said that the story of sailor moon revolves around the concept of love that is given and not that which is taken and i think even snow princess kaguya or princess snow kaguya i will i will reverse those names i try not to um it's very difficult not to um her whole thing is like i want to freeze the world and collect it i want it to be something i take um, and I think that also plays in the whole, like, you know, Takeuchi is getting really into antiquing and you have her main villain who is based on an actual <laughs> antique saying, I want to collect things like they're baubles. Um, I think that's, that's kind of funny, but I do think this idea of like, 
I want this thing, I want this object, and love is seen as not an object, it is seen as a feeling and something that is shared or given in in this movie, and I think that kind of, even though uh, Princess No Kaguya feels like she's sort of this external threat, like she doesn't really tie into Luna's story other than being the thing that's making Kakadu sick, uh, that jewel that falls from the meteorite is the thing that's infecting him, but other than that, like, she just feels like sort of a side antagonist. She really does feel like Sailor Moon's antagonist in this movie, unless Luna's, and this is Luna's story. Right. And I do think, again, if the movie were given a longer runtime, or maybe uh, the original manga had more space to expand upon it, we could maybe find a better way to tie in Princess Kaguya to Usagi and Luna, and not just have it feel like Usagi and Princess Kaguya, and then Luna and her relationship with Kakeru. But I don't think it's necessarily, like, a bad way of doing the plot. Like, I do think you do need a villain. It just does not feel like defeating the villain is necessarily the resolution of this story, because it is Luna's story. Right. <laughs> I mean, it is after the defeat of Princess Snow Kaguya uh, that Luna does her, her human transformation and talks to Kakeru, and they aren't really related to one another. I mean, they are kind of, but not in a way that really feels like it, it resolves the plot. It really does feel like these are two stories that are happen happening concurrently and not uh, together. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, it's like on one hand you have your uh, like regular Sailor Moon-esque story going on, but then you also have like this more like emotional luna development story going on at the same time it's more so like a, a vehicle for that plot if that makes sense right and i wonder if they do this as a musical which the musical will be longer um even with the addition of songs which will you know lengthen the runtime i wonder if they'll you know maybe add more to the story that either d puts more linking tissue between uh, Princess Snow Kaguya and her invasion and Kakadu and Luna's relationship because I think there is a lot to explore there and a lot to kind of relate to this idea of unrequited love or how people view love because even though Princess Snow Kaguya's motivations are nothing to do with love like her objectification of things like I want the earth as a collectible thing as a bauble as an object uh, I think that can tie into how some people view love as a conquest, as something to, to capture or to collect rather than to share. And I would, I would be interesting to, interested to see if there's a way that the musical could expand on this, because I think this is one of the richer stories of the Sailor Moon uh, theatrical films. I would say that this and Sailor Moon R have a lot of interesting ideas that really just cannot be explored within their very short run times. I mean, they're great hour-long stories, but I, I feel like every time I watch this movie, I, I keep thinking, I want more. I want more about these people and how they feel, and, like, I feel like Kakadu is a very interesting character who, you know, we get a good idea of who he is, but we don't really get to sit with him as much as we, as we maybe would like, because we have to go back to the girls and then fighting, or then figuring out what's going on or who this villain is. I mean, even Himeko, uh, the, the, the sort of rival for Luna's affections, who, who does not, uh, is not aware of that. This is a woman who thinks that Luna is just a cat. Everyone thinks that Luna is just a cat, and that kind of does add a, a slightly comedic edge to it, but she's sort of the other woman, and even though she's going into space, and, and Takeuchi does all this research into, you know, going into space, we don't really even get to spend a lot of time with her, and I feel like she's kind of underdeveloped in that way, even though, uh, she's one of the main characters in the movie. Yeah, I, I think it would be fun to see what they would expand on with a musical, because, I mean, we've seen that they've they've changed a lot with different, all the different musicals, you know, they've changed a bit with, with like, the generals and, and everything, and so it'd be really neat to see what they, they could come up with. Especially if they want to do, like, the full cast of Sailor Guardians, because the, the outers are in here, uh, save for uh, Saturn, and even they feel a little like 
extra like they're, it's nice they're there like i'm glad we get the scenes with them we get and they do kind of join in the final battle but i could very easily see them cut from it too right um they're yeah. they're kind of just there because in japan they have been introduced by this point although anna you mentioned that when this aired on toonami this might have been the first that american fans got to see of the or at least a good majority of american fans got to see of the outer century yeah, like I, because I got the movie and I was really excited watching it because I was like, oh, I know that these are the Outer Senshi, but I don't know them yet. Like, because I knew, because S had not been aired on Toonami, I don't think. I think they were still doing original and R. And so this was my first introduction to them and as Tibiusa as a Sailor Senshi. And it, like, I kind of really latched on to what little interaction we had with them. But I'm like, I need to know more about them. Like, I know of them, but I haven't been able to watch them yet. And so it was really neat to see just what little bit we could of them. Yeah. Well, very shortly you would find out that they were uh, uh, cousins. <laughs> of course. I mean, they don't really have, like, any sort of romantic interaction here. So I, I, I don't think you would have to really censor anything for them in this dub. I've not seen the Pioneer dub. I've only seen... Uh, bits of the Viz dub, and every time I've watched this film before, it's been the subtitled version, but... Yeah, I don't think they changed anything at all, really, because there really wasn't much, like you said, in this one with that, so... Yeah. But, yeah, that was... All they really do is drink coffee, and then fight, and then drink coffee drink again. Drink coffee, yeah. yeah they're, in that, they, they're in that same coffee shop twice, <laughs> and it's... I mean, I guess that's just their haunt. Like, you know, it, you, know you find a good place, you stick with it. Um... But yeah, the outers are kind of they're they're here and they do join in the final battle, but they're not uh, again, I, I could see a musical version being like, you know, we we can't afford to have all of these actresses and not use them that much. So either we have to expand their roles or we have to cut them. Yeah, I can um, see them being cut. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of it too is this was a movie made to sort of advertise the anime and they knew the anime fans would be coming to watch it. So I'm sure they're like, we cannot do this movie and not have them. We have to have them at least for like two or three scenes because we know that these kids are going to kind of demand that. Um, Which again, I think is is sort of a slight uh, hindrance to the movie because you can kind of tell where there are parts that are kind of like, okay, Toei wants us to do this. Um, or even if they're in the original manga, if they're not in there that much, we have to kind of do this and that. Like, you can kind of see a little bit of the tension between Takeuchi and the production staff on, like, how much they can follow her manga and then how much they kind of are beholden to Toei. Mm-hmm. And again, I don't think it this damages the film or, or does it any worse, but I think as I the more I watch it, the more I can kind of see some of these sort of agreements they must have made when making it. Um... And again, it's only an hour long, and it manages to pack in a lot in that hour. Like, it, it feels a little longer than an hour, even though you want to see more of it. Right, that's something that I really picked up, is it really didn't feel like this movie was that short. Like, because there's just so much character and content in it. Like, I never felt like anything was lagging or slow. It like felt like there was always something important going on. Which I will say is is a strength of the Sailor Moon theatrical films is they, even though they are only an hour long each, they do feel longer. Like, they do feel like you're getting your money's worth. Um, Maybe not with Supers. I'd say Supers is, again, it's lackluster. I think that's what I, that is my review, that's my one more review of the Supers movie. It is, it is lackluster. Um, it, and Supers as a, as a part of Sailor Moon itself is a controversial topic. To begin with so maybe it was kind of like you know screwed from day one i would say that this film and the sailor moon R movie are both uh a, are very dense for their short run times and definitely you feel like you're getting your bang for your buck when you watch them and they do make a great double feature um like i said i am kind of surprised there hasn't been a triple feature version of them before even though viz did do the double release of this and supers the more I think about it, the more I wonder if they... I, they may have done all three that day. I cannot remember for the life. I think they may have done all three that day. I'll have to look into it, because again, yeah. these were made specifically with the idea of a triple feature in mind, mm-hmm. because that's how the, the Toei Anime Fair worked, was you would see three films in a row, you would buy a ticket for three hours. Um, but yeah, th- there's a lot going on, and I, I kind of like that there are all these sort of lingering threads of symbolism, like there are the 
the uh, compete candies that uh, Kakeru gives Luna, and I love how Basil, one of his questions is, is it okay to give candy to a cat? No, do not give your cat candy. <laughs> I, I, th- this is, this is, uh, this is, I don't know why he does it. I, I cannot think why, in the, even in the reality of Sailor Moon, you would give a cat candy, unless you knew Luna was a magical talking space cat. Like, um, we legit looked it up to see what kind of candy and all it was, and we're like, it's just sugar! It's just yes, sugar candy. it's just sugar. So if, if you're not aware, Kompeto is this uh, sugar candy. They're little tiny stars. It's a Japanese candy. I think it came originally from Portugal. Yes, it is a Portuguese candy. And basically they just put sugar and food dye and they make them into these little pointy stars. Uh, if you have played Super Mario Galaxy, the, um, the star bits in that game are based on Kompeto. And it's just this little tiny, like, finger candy or, like, penny candy that kids eat, and it's literally just sugar. And I guess to go with the space theme and the love theme in this movie, they use Competto frequently as a sort of recurring symbol. And the first time we see it is when Kakadu takes Luna in, thinking she's just a, a stray cat, and he gives her a bowl of milk and some food and a bowl of Competto. Like, and, because p- the Pioneer version was my, my first, like, they will forever be known as Star Flakes to me. But because of that, I didn't know that was an actual candy. Like, because they called them Star Flakes, I thought they were just, like, little cracker things, maybe? Like, I wasn't sure what they were. I didn't know they were a real thing until I watched it, you know, many years later. And I was like, oh, that that's an actual candy, not, like, I thought it was something, I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I love that yes. Kakaru's logic is, oh, I have to feed this cat. Let me give her some sugar. Yeah. Cats love sugar. And it's one of those things, again, like, even within the world of Sailor Moon, I'm like, that that's not something someone would do. That's not a very normal thing. I guess it, it's supposed to play into Kakaru's sort of, like, you know, manic pixie dream boyness. Like, he's sort of like, oh, yes, I believe. Even though these things are all true in the world of Sailor Moon, there was a civilization on the moon. That's completely a actual <laughs> thing in, in this universe. But yeah, everyone maybe. else thinks he's crazy. But he kind of is this sort of like, I believe that there's a goddess on the moon, and I think that Princess Kaguya is a real story, and I think that space is magical and mystical and wonderful, and I'm romantic and whimsical about it. <laughs> To be fair, what, you know, well, yes, it is weird that he gives her candy. I'm also sitting there going, why do you have cat food just readily available? You don't have a cat. I mean, maybe he, like, had some fish on hand. I mean, he does live right <laughs> by the ocean. Maybe it was tuna, yeah. Yeah, he just has some tuna. Okay. And he's like, well, okay, I'll just, you know, cut this up and give it to the cat. I mean, or maybe he had a cat and he didn't, and it ran away and he still had the food left. there. he's like, well, <laughs> getting my use out of it. Um... <laughs> But yes, the the star the star shaped uh, competo candy is a frequently recurring thing in this movie. It's the thing that he and uh, Himeko eat at the end of it when they kind of reunite with each other. Again, I think it's kind of playing into that sort of whimsicalness of of Kakadu that he believes in all of these fantastical things, and so he's of course going to give a cat candy, and he's going to see candy shaped like stars as this wonderful romantic thing. I'm sure it's also, again, kind of tying into the fact this is a children's movie and this is a, a candy that kids would be very familiar with. Um, you know, they're going to be eating it. It's kind of the same reason why Usagi has the fish cake at the beginning. The the pastry is because, of, well, you eat that at, in winter in Japan and this is winter break. That's why they frequently remind us as the audience, hey, they're on winter break because you're on winter break when you watch this and they're girls just like you. <laughs> <laughs> I really like the designs of the characters in this film too. Like I like the girls' uh, sort of walking outfits, the, what they wear when they're out and about in Tokyo. Um, I, I like the way that this, again, this movie feels very wintry. Like you watch it and you feel like you are there in in Tokyo 
uh, in the winter when it's just freezing cold and everyone's just sort of hanging out right before the holidays. Like, it does have that feeling, and I think they captured that very well. I know people like to either, like, make fun of the, the fashion sense of Sailor Moon or, like, comment on how 90s it is, but I actually think the outfits here really are really sort of timeless and fun. Um, they, they do have that sort of, like, winter vacation feel that we don't really get to see all that often. Yeah, it really is a, instead of a Christmas movie, more of, like, a winter season movie. And I think part of that, too, is, like, in Japan, Christmas is, like, a a biggish deal. Like, people do kind of celebrate it as, like, a, as like a lark. Like, you know, this is something that's kind of imported over from America and England and European countries. It's more of a romantic holiday. It's something more like couples do. Like, they give each other gifts. You, you order your KFC and eat it in Japan on Christmas. Um, but it does feel like, again, Christmas is just sort of there, but it's not part of the story. Again, I watch this movie at this time of year just because we have Santa Tuxedo Mask. Um, but it does feel like it, it has this sort of, like, even though I have never been a Japanese middle school girl in the 90s in winter in Tokyo, um, there's just something about watching this movie. I'm like, I have, you know back in the before times, done things like this, like hang out with friends on winter break and it's freezing cold and we're, you know, doing all these silly things during break, going shopping, looking at decorations, all that stuff. It does have this relatability that I do love about Sailor Moon as a franchise. These are, you know, people that we can kind of identify with. This is just a group of friends who, yes, they are superheroes, but the stuff they do day to day, their problems, like little relationship squabbles or the way friends sometimes fight with each other or the way we, you know come together to help each other. I think that's very relatable. But yes, I think that this movie just captures the relatability of the characters in a really endearing way, and I think putting that sort of seasonal spin on it kind of helps make this, as Will said, a very a, a very good winter movie. It's a good movie if, like, it's, it's you know, ugly outside and you just want to, you know, curl up with something cozy and fun. Yeah, as little as we see some of the other inner sentient in this film... Uh, you really do still get to see their character come out from the few scenes that they're in. Especially, like, when they're talking over with the Kotatsu, or when they're in the beginning when they're outside just talking and walking. Like, you still get to see that character that we know, even though they don't really have, like, a huge focus in it. Right, I do love, like, the little tiny character touches. Like, in the beginning of the film, we see uh, what each girl is reading, and Usagi and... Uh... Uh, Minako are both reading the comics based on them. They are reading Sailor Moon and Sailor V. And then, you know, Ray is reading 18 magazine, which I guess is like a parody of 17 magazine. And um, Makoto is reading a cooking magazine. And you see Ami come in and she has like a stack of like math books. I, I do love that little like character joke. Like the, the Ami with the math books is like the big joke of that little scene. But I do like how the animators like drew each of the magazines the girls are going to be reading and yep. tailored it to each of them yeah. even though they don't really comment on it in the text of the film again like we said for a movie that is so short there are lots of things to kind of keep you engaged with it like the little character touches or the way they interact with each other even though again even though this is a sailor moon movie even sailor moon herself is kind of a side character to the whole thing it is mostly about luna kakadu and to a lesser extent himeko um, one thing that I, I noticed with this movie that I've never noticed before, and I don't think I would have noticed it before this last year, um, is Himiko at one point, when, when she first gets to Kakaru's house, the you know, seeing him for the first time since she's been back, she says, I've just gotten back from Marshall. And before, that was just a throwaway line for me. I never paid much attention to it. But... After I've worked at the Space Rocket Center here in Huntsville for the past year, or I did, and uh, one of the things I got to do was visit Marshall Space Flight Center. That is the only Marshall space anything in the world. So Himiko actually came to Huntsville, Alabama. To, like, to, That's where she was coming back from. And I thought that was just so cool that I, I could have that just kind of relationship with this movie now. Right. That's so awesome. Like, it, it goes back into the sort of research that went into this. Like, they know about, like, the different, like, aerospace areas in the world and, like, what logically where she may have been visited based on her repertoire. Because she's, like, already established as a character as, like, this big, like, astronaut or aerospace character. So they were, like, it just goes to show that sort of 
like specific research they went into it and that's that's awesome i didn't even notice that till you brought it up i well like i said based on how we're watching it and we both went marshall and i said basil is there any other marshall other than the space flight center on redstone arsenal and he was like let me check and he checked and they were like no that that's it and that's where pretty much like say say space command is like other than houston there is a space command area there and we i got to see them talk with like the people on the space station so like it's it's a huge deal it's more than i ever expected you know like i said i wouldn't have i never put that together before the last year yeah i thought that when she said i came from marshall that it was just like maybe a place in florida where like cape canaveral is but yeah same here mm-hmm. And it would make sense, considering, you know, we talked earlier about how Naoko Takeuchi went to Candy Space Center. Like, the fact that she doesn't go there, but she goes to Marshall is really cool. It makes me wonder if she went to, like, space camp for a minute. You know? <laughs> like, while I'm in the neighborhood. Well, it's just right up the road. Like, it's it's yeah. so close. Yeah, I mean, she did so much research into this, and I'm sure uh, that... There was probably research done on the part of the animators too, because there is a there is a, a space launch in the film, and even though that is in the manga too, uh, doing something in the manga is different from animating it. So I'm sure that even the animators had to do a lot of research into like what does it look like when a space shuttle takes off. Um, they have oh, yeah. the scene and of that Himiko shuttle, in space. Yeah, I mean that shuttle in general, like it looks so much like the Challenger in front of the Space and Rocket Center. And I think it's kind of funny that when we do see Himeko in space in her full spacesuit on the shuttle, and it's the scene where um, Kakadu and Human Luna kind of fly by, like right before that, the music there is very, very eerie. <laughs> I mean, it, it feels like something bad, like a xenomorph is going to crawl out at any moment, but uh, it, 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 it's, it, it sort of goes into the her seeing the, the glimpse of Luna and Kakadu flying by. The music in this is great. I do love the music that plays whenever Princess Snow Kaguya is around because it's this sort of like weird like uh, wailing, this sort of operatic wailing from this voice on the track that kind of sounds like the wind whistling by. And it, it's very, very atmospheric in how it kind of captures this sort of very eerie like alien presence of uh, Princess Snow Kaguya, while also sounding that frozen, cold, like chill you to the bone effect that the film kind of has in places, especially in the, the the snow dancer scenes. Like the snow dancers themselves are very eerie. For again, uh, even the monsters of the day in the original anime can kind of verge on goofy, but these are just they're so weird and freaky, and how they can have their body parts chopped off and not really even be bothered by it is they, they were a little more uh, intense than I imagine that, you know, for a kid's film they would be. I think they're able to get away with a little bit more with the movies because they're movies. Because, I mean, there's a lot, especially in R, you know, where it's like, this, this is still a kid's show, right? Right, and I think that just makes them, like, even though uh, Princess Snow Kaguya and the Snow Dancers don't really have, like, the dramatic residence that, like, Fiore in, in the Sailor Moon R movie does, where he is, you know, he's not the main villain, spoiler, there is a sort of bigger bad behind him, um, but he still ties into the main storyline much better than I think Princess Snow Kaguya does, because she doesn't really threaten Luna's relationship in, like, a personal way, other than, like, I plan to destroy the, the Earth anyway. Um, but they're still beautifully designed, and I think uh, Masayama's voice work really has this, you know, this sort of eerie high queen effect that I think is, like, easily impersonated and kind of done. Like, it is sort of, like, this very specific archetypical voice in Japanese anime voice acting, but I think she sells it in such a way, like, even when she has, like, the, the typical, like, you know, evil queen laughter and the sort of, like, high lady voice, like, I think she still makes it eerie and threatening in her own way.
So the big reveal at the end of the film is, is famously Luna's human form, and this is not the only human version of Luna that we see. If you've seen the live-action Sailor Moon, then you know what I'm talking about. But uh, this was something that Takeuchi designed herself, and that she really wanted... Uh, this was kind of in the the seed for Sailor Moon was the idea that Luna would turn into a human and they really have a chance to use it up until now. And so we have in the end of the film, she briefly turns into a human and her and Kakadu sort of fly off together in space. Again, sort of Super Mario Galaxy style. They're sort of dancing in space together. <laughs> um, it is one of the most famous shots of the movie is them in that beautiful sort of rainbow Aurora Borealis background floating together. And Luna gets a kiss with Kakadu in her cat form, or in her human form, before she turns back into a cat and returns to Artemis. And uh, I, I don't know how I feel about this, because even though we do have Luna being like, I understand I cannot be with Kakadu, um, and she is kind of accepting of that, it kind of does feel sometimes like she sort of jumps back to Artemis a little too quickly. Like, if I were her, I'd be like, you know what, I just, I just gotta have a relationship. I'm, I'm not, I need some space. I need some time. Um, but we do have to, you know, kind of revert back to the beginning of the story. We have to have them kind of end up getting back together, because they have to have Diana. They have to have their baby. But again, narratively, I kind of wish Artemis had a bigger role to play in the film, because when she does return to him, it just kind of feels like, you know, he hasn't been like a deadbeat boyfriend where he hasn't had anything to do, but he's just been kind of like, hey, I'm here if you need me. And then she never shows up, and then the end is like, okay, you know, it, it feels like I kind of want him to also have more of a through line in the story, and I yeah. hope that if they do expand it for the musical, that they kind of give him more of a role to play, because I think there's a lot of potential there in that story. Right. Yeah, he kind of just... To me... Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I was gonna say, he kind of, like, gives her space, like, he knows she's going through something right now, and she's not really receptive to when he's asking about it. So, in exactly. one way, he's kind of, like, you know, letting her do her thing for a bit, and he knows that, like, he's gonna be there for her when she actually needs him, which I guess is kind of how you can interpret the ending there, because, like, she knows that, like, Artemis is gonna be there for her. Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was thinking, is that he's he's very much a, okay, you you obviously have some things you need to work through. There's obviously something going on, but... You know, I, I am here for you. I will always be here for you. And so I think, I, I feel like it's a little sad in that it seems like she almost settles for Artemis and he is okay with that. But I think it also can be like, she realizes that, you know, she does have a good thing. You know, she just, it just took this to see what she had. Yeah, and I think there could have been a version of this movie where Artemis is sort of like a jealous hothead, and I would not have liked that. That would not have fit his exactly. character. But mm -hmm. I see that as something that could have happened and would have been, like, in a lesser version of the story to kind of give some conflict as to make him be like that. And I think it is healthier and better that he is, again, the sort of like, I'm here if you need me, I'm giving you space. I, I understand that there's something going on. Um, but again, it kind of leaves him out of the story in doing that. Like, there are scenes where Luna's talking to Usagi, like, when they go to the, to the observatory to, to look at Kakadu. Like, I get from a storytelling point you have to have her there so she can turn to Sailor Moon to fight the Snow Dancer. But in terms of the conversation they had, I almost wish it were her and Artemis having it. Mm. Because it feels yeah. like a way to bring him into the story and also give him an emotional arc that kind of follows along with Luna's. Yeah, that would have that would have definitely been yeah a good way to do that. Especially his perspective as kind of an observer in this film, seeing what's going on. Um, slightly unrelated, or slightly related rather, but I love the part when all the girls are talking about Luna being in love, and Usagi just has like no idea how Artemis feels about Luna. I just thought that was such a funny <laughs> scene. Yeah, this this Usagi we have like she does have the whole like you know freezing the earth would be bad, actually, seen with Princess Snow Kaguya, where she's being the traditional, like, super heroine. But other than that, we are full-on in wacky Usagi mode in this <laughs> film. Like, she is a she is a joke factory for most of this film. Um, yep. And I don't hate that. Like, I, I sometimes feel like people can interpret her as, like, too much of, like, a, of a comedic character and don't recognize, like, the growth she does over the course of the series. But for this film, like, I think it's okay that she is mostly wacky usagi 
Uh, she is very much, like, even, I love how they're like, you know, hey, have you not noticed how Luna and Artemis have kind of had, like, this relationship growing at the same time? Like, she's uh, unaware of that, but she's able to talk to Luna about, like, what love is and, like, how she feels about Cockadoo. So she's, like, selectively ignorant of (laughs) of the emotional uh, interiority of Luna. (laughs) Like, I really like the, the scene that they have in Usagi's bedroom where, you know, Luna was asking about, you know, what it was like to kiss, you know, and, and everything, and, and it seemed like they they have a very more equal footing relationship in this movie, in that, like, it's not equal, but more, I guess, reverse, because, you know, Luna's always the one to give advice, so in this one, she's asking Usagi for advice, and so it was really neat to see that, that turnaround. Yeah, it, it's kind of disorienting when you first watch it because you're so used to Luna being the one saying like, oh, you need to do this, or this is what this is like, or oh, to be an adult, you need to do this. And then Luna's the one asking Usagi like, hey, what is it like to be in love with someone? What does it feel like to kiss someone you love? And Usagi is the one giving, like, it feels sweet. It feels like you're melting. It, it feels like they could have made a joke there where she's like, oh, it's fun to kiss a hot boy. Um, but yeah. no, they give, they have her say this sort of like, you know, it's not like she's suddenly, like, a 30-year-old woman, like, she turns into Luna and she's going to be the mother type, but it does sound like a more mature answer from Musagi. It's like, when you kiss someone you love, it feels like you're melting. It's a wonderful, sweet feeling. Yeah. Um, which I think is a good way of writing her, where it's like, you know, she can have these moments of maturity and where she can speak to Luna one-on-one, um, and that Luna, you know, has moments where she needs to know things from Usagi. She needs to learn things from Usagi because she is a human and Luna is not. Um, usually whenever Luna is reminded of her felineness, it's for a joke. It's, oh, I can't do this because I'm a cat. Um, and not like, oh, I, I am a, a, a cat with the intelligence of a human being and I have to live with that. Like, Will, this was your first time seeing this. Uh, Anna, you and I have both seen this a few times before. So did you have any new takeaways, Anna? Or did you have anything that really stood out to you, Will, about this movie? I mean, my my big new thing was the fact that they do mention Huntsville. And I never realized it before. Like, that was such a, a fun surprise, like, you know. <laughs> How about you, Will? Yeah, I think we kind of talked about it a lot, but in terms of this being a very Luna-centric story, it was something I was really not expecting going into this, especially in the beginning when Luna gets saved by Kakaru, when she, she once gets hit by that car. I was like, oh my god, this movie's like getting really intense, and then it like focuses a lot on her. It was a very pleasant surprise, because um, I do like Luna as a character, um, so being able to see this not really being like a sailor moon centric film but more so like a luna centric film in terms of like themes and character was really refreshing and enjoyable like it just took was not expecting it to be that type of movie but i really did enjoy it for that i will say this scene with with kakaru saving luna from the car when i saw it this time around my brain went mom already did the exact same thing luna needs to stop walking in the street it it also just strikes me now having watched this for like you know the the fourth or fifth time it's like you know this is another keiko hong character in sailor moon who is in love with a man that doesn't love her back oh like i'm just i'm just imagining like luna saying like oh i fell in love with this this man on earth who could not love me back as i was and so and like queen barrels in the back with a cigarette like oh honey (laughs) (laughs) tell me about it oh god oh that definitely oh that that definitely puts a fun fun new spin on this movie just I want like I want like uh, Queen Beryl and Luna to have like a first wife club like thing <laughs> going on. I'd be down for that. <laughs> but yes, yeah, so okay. I guess my final uh, thing to say for this movie is: Would you guys recommend this as a movie to watch around Christmas, as a Christmas Definitely. anime movie? Oh, definitely. Yep. It really does have that wintry feel, even if it's not for Christmas specifically, just because of that one tuxedo mask bit. It still has, like, like, I would watch this, like, in November or January, just any, like, chill, wintry time, because it really does hit a lot of that aesthetic and feeling. 
this is a good snow day movie, I would say. Like, you can watch it at Christmas, but I would also say it's good for, like, if you're snowed in and you're like me and you've aged out of finding snow pleasant. Um, it's definitely, like, pop some popcorn and, you know, this will kill an hour of your day. Yep. So that has been our discussion of the Sailor Moon S movie. I'd like to thank everyone for tuning in. I would like to especially thank Anna from the Awesome Cast for joining us and being our guest Mooney on for the episode. Thank you for having me. And I would like to thank Will for joining us because we don't really get him to talk about uh, Sailor Moon sort of things. And he is also a, a Mooney. He is maybe not as long in the tooth with it as me and Anna, but uh, I'm glad to have another perspective on the Sailor Moon franchise with us today. Yeah, thanks. So, Anna, if people want to hear more from you, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at AngelDarkfire. There's no A in dark. And sometimes I'm on the Awesome Cast. Sometimes I'm on the Carbuncle Chronicle whenever we record another one. And eventually, Basil and I will do another uh, Touch by a Duelist podcast. Maybe. <laughs> I feel like that's where all of us now are with like doing anything in the pandemic. It's like it might happen. I don't know. Time the is time is, is a flat circle. Our first and only episode was a year ago, November. And you would Ooh. think with the fact that we are mm-hmm. married and live together, we could plan time to sit down and actually record. We can't. We're terrible at it. And Will, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at swooshxbear. Uh, if you want to see more tweets about video games or how I've been just spending pandemic shoveling M&Ms in my mouth. Um, but you could also check me out at Midshelf Gaming where other uh, frequent Third Impact uh, collaborators, Ryan and Edwin and myself, talk about video games to our heart's desire. But have you ever given M&Ms to a cat? That is the real question. You know, it's something that, I, you know, the chocolate aspect kind of putting me off, but if Luna can eat, can eat sugar stars, you know, maybe anything's possible. And as for me, if you want to keep up with me, you can find me here on the Third Impact Anime Podcast or on Twitter at Calvacun, that is C-A-L-V-A underscore K-U-N, although I am trying not to be on Twitter because I hate it, and it makes me a worse person every time I log in. But sometimes I might be there, the same way that sometimes... You might go into a bar and see that one person you know that they're trying to get better, but god, they keep getting sucked in. Anyway, you can find me on Twitter and on the Third Impact Anime Podcast. Until then, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Holidays, Season's Greetings, uh, God bless us all, Sailor Moon. (laughs) 